We are continuing our sermon series this morning that we have titled And, and this may be the last one, I'm not sure. Uh, if inspiration strikes, I'll have one more next Sunday. If not, this is it. Uh, but I decided that we're going to uh, lift up these two words, male and female. And one of my friends with whom I shared that I was going to be preaching on this subject, he winced. He said, don't do it. And uh, he was joking just a little bit. Uh, but beneath that, that joke is the truth that there are landmines all over the landscape of the subject of gender. Uh, and he's right. But I'm compelled today by two, two burdens uh, to, to present this sermon, to present the Word of God. Uh, the first burden, I feel, is how important I think it is for all of us to have a clear biblical worldview, to have a, a biblical worldview. And I feel that for all of us, but I feel that especially for our young adults, for our youth, and for our children. Because we are, are living in a world that is trying to conform us to the pattern of the world, to the pattern of the, the dominant worldview, and it's hard. And, and I'm sure that, that you've experienced that in some ways. It is hard to, to, to stand on a biblical worldview in a world that is increasingly moving away from that biblical worldview. In another conversation uh, I had with someone about this sermon, the question that he asked was, how did we get here? How did we get to this place? And what he meant by that is, how did we get to the place where a a doctor or a nurse can't deliver a baby and after one quick glance confidently say congratulations you have a boy congratulations you have a girl without fear of reprimand perhaps from a parent who who says no we're gonna we're gonna wait on that and let the child decide what gender he or she they is. How did we get here? And so I've been thinking about that. And I think the way we got here is through a very slow but gradual grooming process. And it's taking place everywhere. It's saturated in our media. At times it may show up in our classrooms. At times it may show up by well-intended adults who are teaching our next generation these things. And so I feel like if we're going to do what the scripture says and not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind, we need to be clear about what the scripture teaches. And so I feel that burden to equip us. But I also feel a second burden. And that burden is to, to talk about, to explore how we as Christians are called to relate to a, a world that operates according to a different worldview. There are a lot of Christians today who are angry. When you look at them, that would be the first adjective you would just say. They're angry. They're angry about some of the things that we've just talked about. And in their anger, they're lashing out and lashing back. They feel like things are being shoved down our throats and we're tired of it. Perhaps forgetting that God's word says, in your anger... Do not, what? Do not sin. Do not sin. And so I feel compelled to remind us all that, that God has not only given us his truth, but he's also given us how we are to, to exhibit the truth, proclaim the truth, how we are to relate to people. It's one of the things I found so remarkable about Jesus. Jesus. There has never been anybody as committed to the truth as Jesus Christ. He literally described himself as the truth. I am the truth. And so everywhere Jesus went, the truth went. And there has never been anyone as winsome, as gracious, as generous as Jesus. And so I feel like he, he is, he's, we are to follow Jesus. We are to walk in the ways of Jesus. 
we too are grooming the next generation. And the next generation, our, our young adults, our youth, and our children, they hear the truth that we're proclaiming, but they also hear the way that we're proclaiming it. And honestly, some of them would say, you hate those people based on how we are proclaiming the truth. And so I feel the burden. How, how are we to, to walk in grace and truth? So today we're lifting up male and female. Join me as we pray. Jesus, you said you are the truth, and you also said that you are the way. So we pray that you would show us your ways, that we may walk in your ways, and show us your truth, that we may stand on your truth. And I pray that the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, would be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin with two foundational truths uh, before we look at the scripture. Foundational truth number one, he is the creator. God is the creator. We confess this all the time. I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth. And one of the images the, the scripture uses over and over again is that of a master potter. He is the master potter. Second foundational truth, he is Lord. He's Lord of heaven. He's Lord of earth. He's Lord by virtue of his authorship. He is the artist. He is the creator, and everything that he has made has its existence due to him. And so he is the Lord which grants him the authority, the right, the prerogative of establishing the design and the parameters and the boundaries of the creation that he has created. So with that in mind, we're going to return to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1 verse 3 says this, God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And so on that very first day of creation, we witness God doing two things that he does on every single creative day, day after that. First thing is that he speaks things into existence. He creates but the second thing he does always after speaking things into existence is he gives them definition, identity. He creates boundaries and parameters. God creates light and he calls, this is day. And then he calls the darkness night. And so you've got day and you've got night and it creates this beautiful cycle that repeats every 24 hours. And it's a, a life-giving cycle. God calls it good. And then we go to day two. God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. God created the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so, God called the expanse sky. And so here again we see God has created sky, but not only does he just create sky, he defines it, he creates boundaries. That sky is separating the water that is above from the water that is below. And what we know is that it's an amazing design. So water below, it evaporates. And it goes up into the sky to the water above. And then eventually it condenses and it precipitates and returns to the water below. And this water cycle creates the possibility of life. It is a life-giving design. God knows what he's doing. We go to the third day. God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place. Let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and the gathered waters he called seas. Again, the process of creation involves this distinguishing of one thing from the other, of establishing parameters and boundaries. It's the boundaries and the parameters that make life possible. We know that when the sea decides not to stay in the sea, when it encroaches on the land, we have words for that, words like tsunami, and it can be devastating. When the river decides not to stay in the river but overflows onto land, we call that a flood, 
and we know that it's not good. There's purpose in the design. In other words, as I've said, God knows what he's doing. So this continues throughout creation, and we come to the sixth day. Every creative day is following the same pattern. God speaks something into existence, gives it definition, gives it identity, gives it distinction, separates one thing from the other, creates parameters and boundaries, does so with good intent. It is all a life-giving design. And so we come to the sixth day, and we should not be surprised that God continues. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So light and dark, day, night, water above, water below, dry ground, gathered seas, male, female. You see the, this binary design? And God calls it good. So the worldview that we are being confronted with today seeks to dismiss and dismantle the boundaries and the parameters that God designed. Away with the God-given definitions and distinctions, away with the differences, at the heart of this dismissal is really just the rejection of those two fundamental truths, that God is the creator, the master potter, and as such, he has the authority, the rightful authority to create as he desires, to set the definitions, the identity, the boundaries, the definition. What we're being told is that, that we have the right, the right to redefine what God has already defined. We have the right to identify as whatever suits us at the moment. But the question that confronts us from Romans chapter 9 is this. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right? The world tells me that I have the right to usurp the authority that belongs to the master potter. If I don't think the, the pink crayon that God has used is, is best, I can swap it out for a blue crayon. And the result of this rebellion is a whole lot of confusion. When a form asking to identify gender has more than two boxes, it's a sign of confusion. When a male swimmer is allowed to compete against women because he self-identifies as a woman and has taken some surgery and some hormone therapy to become, to try and become a woman, that's a sign of confusion. When a baby is born and the baby's parent asks the nurse to refrain from using any pronoun, he or she, because the baby eventually is going to determine that for, for they self. It's a sign of confusion. When a three-year-old child shows up to Head Start and the parent requests the teacher to call the child by whatever name they have selected that day, depending on how they're feeling, that's a sign of confusion. When a man deliberately and deceptively tries to present himself as a woman, and a woman a man, that's a sign of confusion. When a youth who is still developing, brain still developing, is allowed to take hormone, hormone therapy, even without a parent's consent in some states, that's a sign of confusion. Today, confusion abounds, and it's not good. It's not good. The biblical worldview is not confusing. God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. I'm sympathetic 
to people who don't find that so, so simple, who don't find that good because it conflicts with feelings. I'm sympathetic to, to the, the pushback. There are people today who struggle deeply with their God-given gender. To them, it doesn't feel good. These people are reportedly much more likely to attempt suicide multiple times. I don't believe that our attempt to dismantle the, the boundaries and parameters is doing them any favors as we are led to believe that's the answer. But nevertheless, people are in real pain. And we're told that if we fail to affirm the identity of their choosing and the definitions of their choosing, that we're contributing to the pressure, we're contributing to the problem. I'm also aware that there's a, a small percentage of babies who are born with intersex traits. They may have mixed anatomy, mixed biology, and, and gender in these cases isn't so clear-cut and so easy to determine. And so I don't want to be glib about any of this. A little over a year ago, I was at the, the General Synod of the Reformed Church in America, and in this large room, we all sit at round tables, and at the table next to me was a woman who had confided that, that her son was queer, that her son was queer. And as the synod progressed, I, I watched her as different people got up to the microphones and, and made their comments, and I watched the pain that she was experiencing when certain comments were made. Because for her, this wasn't just theoretical, it was personal, a family member, a son. If we don't have any compassion for those who are struggling with these things, we're just not walking in the way of Jesus. We're not. So what is the path forward? Are we to affirm that which runs counter to God's word? Are we to participate in falsehood and call good what, what God's word says is not good? Go along to, to get along? I don't think so. I do know that we are called to love people just as God does. You have never met a single person who's not broken, who's not wounded, you have not met a, someone who's wrestling with some type of sin, including yourself. And so what that does is it puts us all in the same boat. Your sin may present differently. Maybe you don't struggle with gender confusion or, or, or some other thing like that. But I guarantee that your sin presents in another way. We are all in the same boat. And so that alone should breed some compassion. This is why Jesus said, why do you look at the the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. We've all got a plank in our eye. We're all struggling. So what is the path forward? I believe the path forward is encapsulated in the word and. It's encapsulated in this word and. We are called to build our house on the rock, on the rock of truth. We're called to submit to the master potter. He has the right to fashion the clay as he desires. He knows what he's doing. His ways are the best ways. When it comes to the 23rd pair of chromosomes that every one of us has that determines our, our gender, God knew what he was doing when he assigned XX or XY. Every male and every female, every boy, every girl, every man, every woman is created in the likeness and image of God and has profound dignity. The artist is a great artist. And so we are called to this biblical worldview. And, and, we are called to be loving and compassionate and gracious with those people who we would say are building their, their foundation on sandy land. We're called to pray. We are called to invest ourselves in their lives, not just with a, a finger wave back and forth, certainly not to engage in juvenile name-calling, which many in the church have done. 
they'll know we are Christians by our love. So we are called to the truth of Jesus, yes. And we are called to the way of Jesus. Grace and truth. It's really a middle road. It's not an easy road. Because nobody's going to be happy with us. There will be people in one camp who says we are so judgmental. That we are part of the problem. And there will be people in another camp that are saying we're too wishy-washy that we're part of the problem. But I'm okay with that personally because Jesus was identified in similar ways. So practically speaking, what are we to do when someone requests that we use a pronoun like they or them to refer to, to him or her? Or he, even though she's a she, or she, even though he's a he? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, and honestly, I, I have not yet faced that. I know many of our teachers face that regularly. I don't know. I, I do think when, when I do have to face that, that I'm going to try and avoid pronouns altogether. I'll call the person by name, even though that may be awkward. Two closing thoughts. Part of what I think has contributed to this, how did we get here? Part of what has contributed to this is that we have these strong stereotypes of what a boy and a girl should look like and, and what they should do. If a boy is effeminate, he gets labeled. If he doesn't like sports, but he likes theater. If he would rather cook a fish than catch a fish. If he dresses snappy, the list goes on. The world tells that boy, you're queer. You're gay. You're, you're really not a boy. You're a girl in a boy's body, and there's a remedy for that. And likewise, for girls, this is not good. This labeling is harmful. There are only two genders, male and female, but within each of those genders, there's vast diversity. And it's what makes life and it's what makes people so wonderful and so interesting. And so we have got to stop labeling. Those labels do real damage. Second, in communities, there are, in some communities, there are lists of people who are recognized as safe and unsafe to those who are in the, the LGBTQ community. And sadly, anyone who upholds a biblical worldview is, is designated unsafe. I believe that we can and we should be the safest place for anyone, no matter what they're struggling with, because we are them. Remember, we are sinners, and we are all struggling and so we should be the safest place because God calls us to, to love. God calls us to grace and truth. And so when you're in the presence of someone who is walking in the truth of Jesus and walking in the way of Jesus, you are with someone who is safe. And if they're not safe, then they're mixing that up somewhere. They're not walking in the way of Jesus. Join me as we pray. Father God, we, we do worship you as the master potter, as the creator. We say your design is, is wonderful and beautiful. And we also know that there are people with real struggles. Lord, we pray that uh, through the power of your spirit, you would give us discernment in every encounter and every conversation that we would speak and we would act in ways that uh, honor you, in ways that are filled with grace and filled with truth. And Lord, who you set free will be free indeed. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.